Good morning. Morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Berlin. Welcome to the World Health Summit 2020. Um, this has just been an incredible two, three years for all of us. So I, I won't go into any of the details of the tragedies that we've been through as a global community. But, you know, I think we're also really at the heart of some incredible progress, confronting these challenges. And, and I've, there's probably never been a time in history where we've been so focused on this challenge of pandemic preparedness. So we've titled today's session Game Changer. In 10, 20 years time, I hope we can reflect back on this session and tell ourselves we really started changing the game at the World Health Summit 2020, bringing together the thinking that has been happening around the world. And that thinking happens in many bits and pieces, conferences on many specific areas that we all engage in, from the political level to the smallest uh, virological level. And all of these come together. And to start this session, we thought to show you a segment of a film, an excerpt from a very important meeting that happened in Berlin a few months ago. And after the excerpt, I'll tell you the context in which it happened. Can we have it? We start with a tragic story, the death of a 16-year-old youth that died yesterday evening at a local hospital. We understand he was admitted after suffering from shortness of breath, a cough, and a severe rash. Medical staff tell us they had not previously seen this combination of symptoms. The father of the youth that died is also in a critical condition and was part of an international science team that had recently returned from Global Land. These cases are all under investigation by local health authorities here, as they have striking similarities to an unknown disease cluster found in the islands of Global Land, which first reported several cases of a mysterious illness three weeks ago. Our reporter, Martin Wood, is in Global Land and has the latest. We understand that there are a further 38 people in hospital here with this disease. Medical staff tell us that symptoms experienced by patients include shortness of breath, cough and a severe blistering rash. The cases have been reported to WHO and outbreak investigations are underway here in Global Land. And do you have any idea where this disease may have come from? The spread of this disease is suspected to be linked to an international research team that visited Global Land to document the rare and elusive forest leopard. First-hand accounts indicate that the film crew had a dangerous encounter with this creature whilst trying to fit a tracking collar. During the incident, one researcher was bitten by the animal. Possible links are now being investigated between this new disease and the elusive forest leopard. Thank you, Martin. We'll bring you more on this story as it unfolds. Thank you. So my name is Chikwe Ihekwazo. I lead on surveillance and health emergency intelligence systems at the World Health Organization. I also lead uh, the pandemic and epidemic hub in Berlin. This except was presented at the meeting of G7 ministers a few months ago, just a few days literally uh, to the emergence, re-emergence of monkeypox as a global health threat. So it just shows how, how we live in very fragile times and as we're dealing with this, uh, any emergency, there's no, nothing that prevents the next one from coming and the next one from coming. And this year they have been coming in, in, in torrentially almost, as we deal with the floods in Pakistan, there's a new Ebola outbreak in Uganda, and some of our leaders are dealing with this every single day. And on stage this morning, it's a real privilege to have two gentlemen that have been leading on this from different perspectives. Uh, the Honorable Minister of Health for Germany, Professor Karl Lauterbach, who convened the meeting of G7 ministers here in Germany, and the leader of the emergencies program of the World Health Organization, my boss, Mike Ryan, who will now join us on stage and answer a few questions on the incredible work of the continent. So 
Thanks. Thanks, Carl. I think I'll start with you. Um, thank you so much. Firstly, thank you uh, for hosting us in this incredible venue and in Berlin, and thank you for the grace of the Chancellor yesterday evening at the opening. Um, Carl, your, your G7 presidency has really put forward, been so progressive in this space of pandemic preparedness. You've proposed a new G7 pact, uh, demonstrating leadership on the side of the G7. Um, could you tell us a little bit about the progress that has been made and your vision for the future around the pact? Yes, thank you, Chico, for this opportunity. Uh, when Germany um, assumed the G7 presidency, uh, my impression was that there was a lot of spirit uh, in order to prepare for future pandemics, but there was, let's say, no clear idea what to do specifically. So a lot of goodwill, many ideas, but no specific, let's say, a tool to move forward. So what we then agreed upon is that we would con have, let's say, leading scientists from all over the world to come to Berlin to meet a couple of times and to discuss without, let's say, a formal agenda, to discuss without, let's say, publicity, without press coverage, simply what is needed, what are the what is lacking and what could be done better. And that was a very helpful in my opinion, a very helpful way to go about these things. I think in total we met three times. This was roughly speaking 30 to 40 people coming from all over the world, uh, leaders in the field. And uh, some of them are indeed here in the room. I could name many, but I want to name just one, Jeremy Farrar, who is here to today. And he, he was also co-organizing this. So what then came out is that we are lacking in particular, a workforce which is better prepared to recognize a possible pandemic and to avoid that an outbreak becomes a pandemic. The old epidemiological saying is that outbreaks are mandatory, pandemics are optional. So there, it is impossible to avoid outbreaks, but it is possible very often to avoid pandemics. And we wanted to create a workforce which internationally can help to, let's say, avoid that outbreaks become pandemics. So that was the number one conclusion from these three meetings that we did have. And uh, number two, um, there is also, uh, let's say, you, you need to be more spe specific. How, what is the major instrument in avoiding that an outbreak becomes a pandemic? And the major technical in instrument is surveillance. And there is a lack of skills in surveillance. There is lack of money for surveillance. So therefore, we wanted to create something that makes education and workforce more likely to come about and also to invest money into surveillance systems. So that was one of the leading ideas and that created the fact, the pact for pandemic uh, preparedness. And this was then introduced to uh, the World Bank and to the European uh, uh, to, you, to, to the European Union, basically to uh, introduce to uh, leaders in the US, uh, scientific leaders, but also the US administration. And ultimately, so the financial intermediary fund uh, that was created uh, 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 took up this idea that we have to invest in pandemic preparedness by investing into a workforce, young people, and investing into pandemic surveillance. I think in particular the idea that we educate the workforce is very important. We have many young people who want to, who are basically socialized by the pandemic. They lived yeah. into the pandemic, they were young in the pandemic. They are now considering what should we study? I mean, what should we spend our life with? Mm -hmm. And they are prepared like the Fridays for Future generation to invest their life into pandemic, pandemic control mm -hmm. and pandemic preparedness. And in order to, uh, to give them an opportunity to study this, we need a few Fridays for Future group that focuses on pandemic preparedness. And we need hubs in the south and in the north where they can educate themselves, where they are supported, where they are then finally connected where there is an alumni network. So all of this was a very specific idea and is still rolled out. And I hope it will move forward, but so far things are going well. 
And uh, I, I'm impressed by the leadership that also WHO and you have given, and also Mike have given. Uh, I think uh, it's no secret if I disclose here that you were one of the experts following us, giving us advice in all of this. So, Mike, we have learned a lot uh, also from you and uh, around this. I think, final word, it is a mistake to believe if there is future pandemics, that we can simply call a workforce which is already out there and fly it into the global land where the pandemic takes place. That will not happen. First of all, we do not have the workforce, we do not have the surveillance systems, and people will also not permit it to get into global land. So that will never fly, this will not work. It will only work if we have the people well educated on the ground with the skills, with a network of trust, and this is what yeah. all of the, that is what the Pact for Pandemic Preparedness or Readiness is all about. Thanks, Carl. It's a, a great vision for the future. Um, Mike, to, to come to you, um, um, your, the team I met at WHO, yourself, so say all our colleagues in our regional offices, country offices, 24 seven, we're thinking, supporting new, you almost going to bed, you're wondering what faces you by the time you wake up, if you get to the point of waking up. In the midst of all of, <laughs> before the call, before the call, not that anything will happen to you. <laughs> In the midst of all of this, uh, your team, our team uh, with the DG put together 10 proposals to make the world a safer place. And it's very hard to do the thinking when you're always responding. But how do you think we can take this forward? What do you think are the priorities around uh, the, the new proposal in front of the world uh, on, the health, on the health emergency preparedness and response architecture for the future? How long do you have? Um, <laughs> first of all, it's my first time in plenary at the, at the summit. So thank you to the organizers for the fabulous event. Uh, and great to see so many young people here, actually. I was uh, interrogated for two hours last night by a bunch <laughs> of you. Uh, and uh, it was absolutely stimulating. Uh, and we need that. We need the next generation. And uh, I think that's fantastic to see it here. Uh, and what Carl has been speaking about is empowering the next generation of public health leaders, yeah. equipping them, giving them the tools at all levels, north and south, creating a new workforce that can face these threats. But it's a permanent process now. And you said it, Chikwe, we're in permanent stress response. Uh, climate is intertwined with conflict, is intertwined with infectious diseases. This is not going to stop. The, our, our planet is, fra is fragile. Our biome is disrupted. Our societies are inequitous. Our politics, quite frankly, at times is laughable in terms of the, some of the, the more autocratic uh, leadership styles around the world. Um, and therefore, the prospect is these emergencies will continue. So we can either have an outside in or a top down approach to that, which will help at times, you know, the emergency response. But really, it doesn't work unless you build resilience into the system. We learned this in natural disasters in the 80s and 90s. 90%, 95% of people who survive a natural disaster survive it because their neighbors and their families dig them out from under a building or pull them out of the water. And I think that's exactly the same principle in epidemics. It is local response. It is community facing response. It is local community based surveillance, point of care diagnostics, the ability to understand there's a problem in the community and the rapid provision of support to a community before an outbreak becomes a national or global event. And so I think we have to, when we talk about it, that's I think what Ted Ross is trying to do with his vision, is to summarize and synthesize in one paper a vision for the future that has those building blocks, two of which Carl has alluded to, and I thank him personally for his leadership uh, on, on those two hugely important areas. Without data, you're blind. Without a workforce, you have no capacity to act. Uh, and those two things are absolutely central. But I think we have to, I say it at times when people laugh, but you know, we talk about primary healthcare and we talk about health systems. The last mile of healthcare delivery, we always talk about that. We have to get to the last mile of delivery to deliver healthcare to people. Well, that last mile of delivery is the first mile of health security. And we forget that. It's the same system out there. There aren't two systems yeah. when you go down to the sub sub level. Yeah. It's one system. It's one healthcare system. So we do have to, I think, in, as we build this out, uh, Chikwe, 
build global solutions, yes, global innovation, global platforms, uh, global funding, global um, uh, innovation. But what we need to understand is none of it will work unless it's articulated with community facing local systems. And I think that's the trick for WHO. That's the translation we have to do. We're, we're, WHO shouldn't be in the space competing with innovators and the private sector and universities and scientists doing brilliant work. Equally, it's the government's responsibility to deliver healthcare and deliver public health. What we need to do is connect those two processes. And I think that's what we're really, I think is the future. Thanks, Mike. I think you've just hit the nail on the head. You know, there are many processes happening. The, the response to the pandemic is happening in many, in academic institutions, in governments, in local, national. These are all pieces of a puzzle that we're trying to pull together. So, Carl, thinking about that, what, what type of governance do you think we need to pull this together, to, to make it, to make sense for the world that in which there's kind of no world government, but we do need a governance infrastructure to make sure that this actually leads to the impact that we would like it to? Well, first of all, I think that WHO needs to play a central role. Mm because there's many institutions that are responsible for specific tasks. For example, I think that uh, Act A, for example, was very successful and is an organization, uh, in my opinion, which should stay because it has worked well. If you think how long it took in order to have, let's say, um, HIV treatments uh, delivered in poorer countries, speaking decades but here the vaccines came within months I mean, not perfect not perfect but nevertheless worked well uh, so therefore uh, uh, strengthening existing institu institutions rather than mushrooming more and more institutions is very important and you need one central agency and this is in my opinion WHO. WHO is the only health institution worldwide which is accepted by all and has also proven its value in the pandemic. So strengthen WHO, but align it with more specific institutions that have a particular task, for example, the Pact for Pandemic Readiness Act A and so forth. So, and what we should not do is create more and more institutions. When the pandemic happened, uh, if you look at the list of institutions which was already responsible for pandemic control, the list is endlessly. I mean, it is almost impossible to uh, remember all the institutions responsible for pandemic control when SARS-CoV-2 came about. So you wonder how did the virus ever manage to move forward? How was it possible? Uh, because many of those institutions were simply acronyms without much funding, without much training, and no clear-cut responsibility. So in my opinion, it is important that we, instead of creating more and more institutions, align the institutions that we do have in place, create an, a clear-cut division of labor, support those that are needed, and integrate those that are no longer needed into the existing ones. So that is what we need. And most important, and I agree with Mike, I mean, talking to the younger generation, we now have the chance of, let's say, having a young generation that is, that was so, that lived into the pandemic to get them interested into pandemic control. Because pandemics and everything around pandemics will become ever more important. We will either spiral upwards or spiral downwards. Uh, if we spiral, downwards we will have more climate change more pandemics because of climate change we will have poorer primary health because of climate change and pandemics and we will have more wars because all of this is happening so this is an endless spiral downwards because if you have wars on uh, the grounds of already existing climate change, the wars will then postpone the reconstruction of the energy, energy provisions, the green revolution and so forth. So it's a spiral downwards, which is not excluded. Yeah. There is no reason to believe that such a spiral downwards will not occur. 
And we could also have a spiral upwards where we uh, have where we have better climate control, you know, we have fewer pandemics, where we have better primary health care, where we have fewer wars because there is less need and so forth. So whether we see a spiral upward or a spiral downward is a completely open question. And if you look at the world nowadays, I mean, it looks more like a spiral downwards than a, than a spiral upwards because we again, we, knew, we have more outbreaks. We have cholera, we have Ebola, we have polio. So the COVID pandemic is far from over. If you look at, let's say, the governing, um, let's say, institutions and world leaders, many of whom are not really encouraging and sometimes even their knowledge about, let's say, how pandemics happen is limited to say the best. Also, let's say the response against climate change in many parts of the world is far from appropriate. So if not much does happen, I think a spiral downward, at least currently, if I, even if I look at the EU, I mean, the EU was typically the most stable uh, Econ economic and also political ground. Currently, the EU is neither economically nor politically fully stable. So a, a spiral downward, in my opinion, is at, currently at least more likely than a spiral upward. Mm -hmm. And if you want to have a spiral upward, it is a younger generation which is needed here. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we, we, need, we need meetings like this one, but we need people who go away from these meetings and want to invest their lives into the, let's say, spiral upward. <laughs> Couldn't have put it better, Carl, and I think that's the challenge and that's the beauty of the World Health Summit is the diversity of attendance. But m maybe, Mike, to pick, pick up on that, Carl said he'd like to see WHO continuing to push uh, this space and providing the leadership. Um, you have you lead the emergencies program. Yesterday we signed uh, the DG signed a, a memorandum of a memorandum of understanding with uh, the International Association of National Public Health Institutes. Uh, there are so many new actors in academia um, across the world that we need to 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 implement that. So, what's your vision of how? to provide the governance, but still be open and accessible and use the many other players that we need in order to, for us to deliver on health security to the world? Um, I think the first thing we have to do as institutions, global institutions and the main represented here, um, is leave our egos at the door and actually start focusing on the people we serve. Um, uh, and I say that to ourselves more as WHO than anyone else in this room. Um, because I think the one thing that we lose sight of in, in my career, you know, I find that too. I was in Pakistan the week before last. There's 700,000 women going to give birth in Pakistan in the flood affected areas in the next six months, 70,000 a month, and the healthcare system is destroyed. You know, that's what you need to look at. That's what we need to focus on for the next four months. Not who's the biggest dog in the room, uh, who's got the biggest budget, uh, who, you know. <laughs> um, or visiting a, uh, Uganda last week, and we stood for a photograph with the, with the healthcare workers and the, the team working in Mubende District Hospital. And by the way, the vast majority of them, female health workers, doctors and nurses, which was fantastic to see. But to see what they would be doing that night, I was getting back on an airplane to fly back to Geneva so I could fly to the World Health Summit. They were turning around and going back in to an Ebola treatment unit to spend a 12 hour shift trying to save lives, not infect themselves and bring it home to their own families. They're the real heroes, they're not me. It's not Chikwe. <laughs> and if, if we for a moment in every meeting before we begin one and a moment before we write every email and a moment before we have a conversation in a coffee shop to criticize our sister organizations, if we could just think for one second before everything we do about someone in the field, something, some memory, and I love going back to the field, I'm useless in the field now, I'm probably way beyond my sell-by date, 
But there's something empowering about going out and looking and seeing what it's really like out there for frontline workers. That's what keeps me honest. That's what keeps me committed to what I do. So I do think when we talk about how to make this work, and there's lots of things we can do managerially, and there's lots of things we can do to manage projects and work better together. But I think we need to actually commit once again, spiritually, to the concept of service, of serving those who have least. Because we have most. We're sitting in a beautiful hotel here, in beautiful city. All of us, for one level or another, are privileged. The people who aren't privileged today are the people the refugees and the migrants living in Uganda who may or may not be served in this response, or the people displaced in Pakistan or, or whatever. But we also need to bring all of that energy together. I was in Yerevan uh, at the Global Emergency Medical Teams meeting. We have now nearly 20,000 fully trained emergency medical team personnel, pre-qualified, ready to deploy from the national institutions anywhere in the world at 24 hours notice. Surgeons, anaesthetists, doctors, nurses, physiotherapists. That's incredible. Fully standardized according to WHO standards where we can say to government X, we can send five medical teams and these are their standards. These are the standards they meet. And I think we need to continue to recognize that countries in the South no longer accept and I'll say this, at the risk of being controversial, the scientific neo-colonialism of the North, right? Uh, they, there, needs, there needs to be a new agreement between the North and the South. We're in this together. It's not about giving assistance and development aid and all of that. It's about working together to fix problems. The, the, I've, in my experience, the most resilient communities I've ever met have been in the worst possible disasters. Uh, the most adaptive community. We talk about adaptation and we talk about resilience and we talk about permanent state of crisis. Well, you know who's living in that permanent state of crisis? The people living in the refugee camps on the Sudanese Tigrayan border or, or the people living in Afghanistan or Pakistan who are displaced by floods. So I, I, I think what we need to do is recognize that in this process, we're going to learn from each other. There is no North and South anymore. Yeah. It's just this planet and us that inhabit it. And we need to be prepared to be humble and the lessons we learn. I think if we bring humility and service to the center of this, if we leave our egos at the door, we might actually for once deliver solutions that make a difference in people's lives. So, th thanks, Carl. Thanks, Mike. I, I don't know what else to say. I can't summarize. I think it was such a good note to end. And, and just on behalf of everyone to the room, in the room, just to thank both of you for the leadership that you provide to the world. So thank you very much. Thank you. Good. So to start the next session, we'll have another short film, short clip, um, while the colleagues uh, add a few more seats to the uh, front row for the next uh, panel. Uh, thank you for engagement so far. So can we have uh, um, uh, the next film? Thanks to all. This summit and today's conversation about architecture for pandemic preparedness comes at exactly the right time. A once effort to transform the system for pandemic preparedness and response and avoid the risk that the world slides into neglect despite the loss of lives and gains in development. It is time to transform the global health architecture. We've been through enough. The continuing COVID-19 pandemic, the West African Ebola epidemic, MERS, H1N1 and SARS. Each crisis has taught us that the architecture is not fit for purpose. We know a new health threat will appear again and we still will not be ready for it. We need action now at a global level with sufficient resources and political will from international to national levels. The Independent Panel for Pandemic Preparedness and Response, which I had the honor to co-chair, 
recommended a package of reforms to transform the international system for pandemic preparedness and response. The key is to have a complete system that links multi-sectoral inclusive governance with sustained finance, a stronger, more independent WHO that takes a precautionary approach and warns the world of new threats with speed, regions and countries that are equipped to take action, equitable access to medical countermeasures, national health systems that can provide universal health coverage and social protections and be equipped to detect, report, and contain new health threats. On the positive side, there is progress in many of these areas, but the progress has limitations. There is a new pandemic fund housed at the World Bank, but so far just one-tenth of the 10.5 billion in annual funds required have been pledged. These funds are particularly required in low and middle income countries. There's a process to negotiate a new pandemic instrument, but it is still in early days and is the process to amend, as is the process to amend the international health regulations. WHO has received support to increase the proportion of assessed contribution to its base budget to 50%, but not until at minimum 2028. One major recommendation from the independent panel is for a leader level Global Health Threats Council. We envisioned a multi-sectoral inclusive high level leadership council that maintains momentum for pandemic preparedness and response. It would of course work very closely with WHO and other relevant agencies and the private sector. Pandemic preparedness extends beyond the health sector as we have painfully relearned in the last two and a half years. There are different proposals for such a council the independent panel proposed it be agreed through a political declaration at a high level meeting of the United Nations General Assembly, which will take place next year. The Secretary General through our common agenda is proposing a leader level emergency platform to manage complex emergencies. These options should be discussed but the bottom line is we need to draw the line at more talk and we need action. Let us all from this meeting and henceforth act to prepare our nations for any threat set. Thank you. That was uh, former president, the 24th president of Liberia, Mrs. Ellen Johnson Sirleaf. Um, you know, she just always amazes us with the energy she still has. Can I now invite uh, our colleagues, uh, Marion, Elsie, Jawad, um, and uh, Sandra to join us on the next panel, please. <laughs> and introduce yourself as well as you do, uh, as you start. But really, this, this pandemic, if we've learned anything about from it, is, is the, the limited relevance of our political boundaries. And, and the EU is probably, across the world, the closest you can come to some form of regional government. So how do you think we can move on this and what can we learn from the work you did 
what are your reflections for the future around this cross-border talent that we have? Thank you, Chikwa. I'm humbled to be here with you. Can yeah. I shake hands? Yeah. Because, you know, he is uh, someone who worked with someone that I have in my DG, and I'm very proud to be here, and also proud to be here next to, can I call you Marion? Yes. Because she will also tell you stories about the big scientific work that has been going on with the president and all during the, the pandemic. Why do I start with both of them? Because, you know, when the emergency struck at the end of the day, we were really going into our address books, address books to know who could be helpful. And this should not happen, by the way. I would not give you <laughs> this as a recipe. There was another thing that struck me, and you say it's, you know, the closest it comes to uh, multifarious uh, uh, membership of, uh, of an international organization, the EU. Yes, it is true, and this is communication. I think when the pandemic struck, we were not ready to communicate with one voice. So. You know, at the beginning, there was a bit of improvisation. I also must admit that when I was having my meetings with scientists and they would say, well, there's an interval of confidence of such as I say, yeah, well, you know, I need to say yes or no to this thing. I cannot be transferring this at the political level with such a, you know, uh, a, 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 a probabilistic uh, thing. So communication communication was the first thing that in 27 member states was a, a complex thing but it was also internationally let's uh, let's admit even now we have someone who said the pandemic is over and we had just issued a communication saying you know we are transiting out of covid but covid will stay with us so communication um we actually launched uh, on the 11th of November 2020. I, re I recall the date because it was under German presidency and uh, the 11th of November is a very momentous date for Germany. So it was very good that uh, the German presidency decided with us to launch a huge um, legislative piece. Why do I call this internal legislative piece? Because our cross-border health threats was not uh, up to standards. We had a, a piece of legislation, you know, it was something very, very much like a recommendation thing. So now we have a regulation and this monumental piece of legislation, what did it do? First of all, it, st it strengthened the role of some of our agencies, ECDC, EMA. Why these two? Easy to guess for ECDC, perhaps. But for EMA is perhaps less visible, let me say to you, had we not adopted a new system to approve of vaccines, which we called rolling review, we would not have made it to the authorization because, you know, authorizations take a long time. Perhaps developing vaccines was faster than the authorization. <laughs> so um, with, the, with the then uh, head of the agency, Guido Rassi, I said, listen, no way we, we will present you a pack at the end. And no, we need to start now. And he had this very good idea. I know that some already do uh, use this role in review. So it's nothing new in the world. I don't think that the problem is people think we, we do new things. No, no. Many Many people have already thought about how to act in an emergency. So first thing, ECDC and EMA mandates were reviewed and strengthened. Then, you know, obviously we created uh, an, agency, an agency, an authority, let's call it. We, we, we stopped at an authority and to deal with the preparedness, HERA, to buy the countermeasures because, you know, I did it, I bought within the, I would say the structures that we had, but the structures were very rickety. So you need some professionals to deal with the contracts and with all of that. So, and this at international level, I think we need to draw a lesson, eh? Act A, you know that name, Act A. Uh, so we also uh, had finally a big review of how we function internally. And this is the most important piece perhaps for you. I would suggest you read it internally in the EU when an emergency strikes. So governance and competence, uh, it's a very difficult domain. Beware that this is competence of the member states. But we have had a few things that were important. First of all, what do you need when an emergency strike? You need a plan. So to have that plan is not that you do like something you, you put on a piece of paper ideas. You need to have a review. A review between peers did not work in the past because 
review between member states who are saying, oh yes, you did good, perhaps you can, no, no. We are going to do a bit of a, an assessment, which was a big battle in the discussions for this piece of law, an assessment of the preparedness of member states. What is the good side for the member states that have accepted this stricter review is that they will be helped to meet, I would say, the level of preparedness that is necessary. So you tell them you are not there yet, but we will devote money. Let me say that this is a part that you cannot forget. Money is always very important in these discussions. So, first of all, for the international level, I think we need to have a way of assessing gaps. Uh, and we need also to put our money where these gaps are now. I will come into that at the end. Briefly. So, yeah, briefly. So once you have reviewed uh, the functioning, I would say, of the member states, you need a plan that works with all. And here is the rub. What sort of governance do you, do you get to function okay. there? So let me say it's extremely important to realize that in a sense, what we are missing at international level is a place where this governance can be apportioned in a credible and legitimate way. Within the Union, within the structures of European Parliament, Council and Commission, we will always find a means, I don't go into the legal details of this, we will always find the means to have the decision-making process in a legitimate way. Uh, internationally, I think that the Monty report is very clear. We don't have yet a place where this governance is placed. Final word on the money. We have been supporting all sorts of initiatives uh, uh, from Act 8 to the 5th. And here the 5th, again, um, I would like to say for it to function in an emergency, it needs to be very much a health, a health project. And uh, of course, the health issue now needs to be articulated. How do you help the local communities is perhaps better done through a regional organization. I will not go there. There are much better people who can speak about that. But the surveillance, even for the Ebola cases these days, we know it's the first step. It's the first doctor who sees a patient who needs to be capable and trained to say, this is Ebola, you should not go to Kampala. But you know, if the person is left to go and infect a hospital, then you know, we are in trouble. And that is where our words need to match our deeds, and we're still not yet there. Sorry to have been long. But... No, no, Sandra, excellent points you made on various levels uh, that will all come together as the, the co uh, conversation progresses. To, to take a, a step forward, Marion, if I asked, if I put out the question to the hall now, who agrees with the One Health concept? I bet you 99% of the hands in the room will go up. If I ask them, how do we operationalize this in our day-to-day -day work? Um, I bet you as well, we will all struggle. So you've been in this space for many years. Can you reflect a little bit in terms of what you've learned and, and challenge us for the future in this regard? Uh, yes, that's a topic uh, near to my heart and interests. But yes, we talk, but uh, making it happen is really challenging. But I do see this uh, at this moment in time really as the concept that brings these different uh, challenges together. One Health, by definition, is about balancing the health of humans, animals and ecosystems uh, that are under pressure also from what we do. There's the climate pressure, there's all the deforestation, and that is part of what health should be. Um, now, if that's what we think about, and then, for instance, thinking about bringing surveillance forward, it is a very disruptive way of thinking. This is not bringing the pathogen surveillance for humans and animals together. No, it's far more than that. It's uh, in, in and the uh, why he, uh, One Health uh, expert panel is working on a piece to try and explain that. It is also trying to think forward about what drives our risk of new diseases and of outbreaks. And can we, with all the uh, knowledge, local knowledge, uh, knowledge at national institutions, international institutions, can we bring that together in smart ways to, uh, to see where we should stick our thermometer? Where? 
our ecosystem so under pressure that you can just count on problems occurring because that would then uh, be a way of guiding where we strengthen deeper surveillance with different partnerships it's really uh, this is uh, not only who it's the whole ecology field it's the climate field it's uh, entomologists it's many different new players that then need to convene so i think a real challenge is in how do you build this infrastructure with the necessary legislation and, and agreements forward but with the flexibility to allow this and that's i i hear you asking that question and i think it's a huge challenge and the second piece that is definitely needed there is then what now we do detect something unusual then what and here i think we need massive action if if you look at we've had a pandemic in a pandemic with the global dissemination of highly pathogenic avian influenza this used to be a localized problem it's now global in wild birds everywhere a new global pandemic threat and we are not discussing what that means for our level of alert uh, at this moment. And to me, that shows the disconnect that we really need to start bridging. So we have our work cut out for us. <laughs> so let, let me move to you, Elsie. Uh, firstly, um, just to say, I, I'm really proud of you being on this stage. You are one of three very strong female directors leading the Nigeria CDC, with whom I was privileged to work for five years. So thank you very much. Now, all these conversations ultimately boils down to action at the national, regional, and local level, right? You, you've led surveillance for Nigeria, huge country, 200 million people in Africa. What does your day-to-day -day life look like responding to all these threats every day of the week? Thank you, Jikwe. Uh, really privileged to be here. Yes, I really want to talk on this in some very key areas. I'll look at the surveillance. Now, our surveillance structure is such that we have our data that flows right from the community up to the national level. Now, before COVID, we were worn mostly on paper base, and then we tried to, you know, go digital and we started using a software uh, called SOMAS, the Surveillance Outbreak Management Analysis System. Uh, we worked with, actually was worked, we worked with our German colleagues to develop that and about, uh, now what we're doing with it is fantastic within the country. We started, but uh, within, when, uh, before COVID we just, deployed sporadically and when there's an outbreak we'll deploy to that state but when covid came we knew that we needed to have our data real time and how do we do this if we do not use the software the go digital so within six months we were able to deploy the software with of course support from our partners and the government deploy to all the states and the local governments and some treatment centers for COVID so we could receive data real time. The other area I also want to mention is uh, we have like a, a kind of a supplementing the, um, uh, uh, the traditional surveillance structure and that's the event-based surveillance. We had a system that's where we were mining for data we had a software that we're using that was localized. It's called Tatafo. Now, Tatafo in one of our Nigerian language, I'm so sure some of our Nigerian is gossip. <laughs> so you mine information where people are talking about something, you get it from the different languages, and then you try to investigate to find out why they are discussing on this particular event. And so that we use to you know, collect information from the public, from the community. And so when COVID started, we expanded on that. Of course, we expanded on the language that's because we had to bring in more languages so that we could pick more of the information. And so 
were able to get more information right from the community because you see the community is very important if you do not get information from the community and you're just taking decisions and making policies it's very dangerous because they are the ones that will really implement it and if they don't understand what you're saying then you're just you know you're just making your policies there at the top and so we were able to use that we also had expanded our call center because in the event based surveillance we had call centers so we expanded and initially we had just five uh, stations and we expanded to over 120 bringing in other uh, sectors to be to receive calls we trained all the other sectors including the security and that's one beautiful thing we did because the security was very key for us in nigeria and especially during the lockdown they were the ones that actually helped us to carry out most of our supplies so now looking at the laboratory area now laboratory was something that okay people just felt okay laboratory is there but during COVID, in fact, the policymakers knew and appreciated the importance of laboratory for public health. And that was very key. We had only five labs before COVID that could do molecular testing. But uh, during COVID, we were even, I'm sure Chik will re remember some of the governors calling him at 3 a.m., telling him, when are you coming to activate my lab? I need to have a molecular lab in my state. And so it was so overwhelming. But you know that was a game changer for us, because now laboratory is key, and they know the importance of laboratory. And so that's one other key area. So for now, we have over 150 laboratories that could do molecular testing in, in Nigeria. And so now we can say we have public health laboratories in all the subnational at the subnational level that could test for any uh, uh, do molecular testing and so that's very key for us then we also have the emergency operation centers and those were you know we started activating and establishing in this at the subnational level at the national level we have actually had but at the subnational level we started but with co the coming of COVID, the pandemic, we had we knew we needed to, you know, activate those that space for the state at the subnational level because that's where you have all the stakeholders coming together and meeting and making decisions on events or diseases. So, for the states to be able to take control and take action, we needed to do that, and so we were able to do that within some few months during COVID. And then we also have the our communication. I mean, communication is something that I think was a big problem. We had the infodemics, people were just bringing out information and telling people all sorts of stories. So what we did now, we now, we brought up our young, you know, one very beautiful thing about Nigeria Center for Disease Control is 85% of our uh, uh, staff are the young ones. Very vibrant, very intelligent, but you need to guide them. And so that was what we did. We guided them, so we allowed them to bring in their innovations, what we could do to get across to the young population, because also in Nigeria, about 60% of the population are the youths. And so we needed to get that information across to them. So what did we do? We moved away from, well, we didn't totally move away. We had to redirect our way of getting information across, and we got into the social media, and so, most of our information, we were getting information out to the in, in the social media, sending in our reports daily in the social media, posting you know information on what you are you expected to do. And I think the even the presidential tax force, the the highest level of coordination within the country, then tapped into that, and they you know followed us, and they were also using that system, that avenue to get across to the people. And that was very key for us. Then the other big one is also our research. The last we, one. <laughs> <laughs> we have uh, the research, um, the Nigeria COVID uh, Research Coalition, and that's brought all the stakeholders. We never had that before where you have the academia, the professional, the public health professionals, the social scientists, we have the, um, even the COVID um, uh, survivors were part of the group. So coming together to determine, to look at the research areas, the gaps, and going to research to find out what is happening. So it's like you're involving everybody. 
So for, for me, I think um, maybe I just want to stop there. So for the key areas is collaboration, because that is very key. In fact, there's one other big one I would have talked about, the partnership. We had a private uh, uh, sector coming together to form a coalition to come together to support the government. And that was a very big one because you know the private sectors usually don't feel that they don't trust the government. So they don't want to come in to do anything with the yeah. government. So, but this time around they came up and they supported the government. And that was a very big one. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. I know if I leave you, you could go on and on. But uh, it's, and, and you know, I, we can all feel the passion with which you did your work. Uh, Joad, you know, we've heard uh, from the regional level, we've heard about working across sectors, we've heard a national perspective. Earlier, we heard from the minister uh, telling us about the G7 uh, discussions and the pact. You know, you, you, on behalf of the organization in your role, lead uh, an interesting conversation going on right now. And it involves, we can't choose which government to work with. It will work with all, uh, let me get my numbers right, 194 member states. And you have to give, uh, you know, a same attention to almost each of them. Tell us about this process, how you're bringing it all together, and how we're enabling every country to have a voice in these important conversations. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Tikwi. Uh, I think for, for somebody like me who spent uh, more than 20 years in public health arena, I'm really happy to see, in, uh, to see a shift in thinking uh, of the international community. During the 90s, when health crisis happened, the solution was to create a new institution. These days, we have a health crisis and the reaction is, let us strengthen what we have. They take make stronger what we have rather than create a new institution and uh, create duplication ipso facto. And it, this is a, a big shift in all things. This is what led me very optimistic about our future preparedness. In the past, we had several crises that we just forget and neglect. We had SARS, we had, uh, of course, H1N1, and we have the MERS and the Ebola. But these days, uh, what makes me very optimistic is the member states are taking it very seriously. This is why they collectively agreed to work on two very important work streams. Uh, one, that they established international negotiation body in uh, last November, during a special session of the World Health Assembly, to discuss and negotiate a global instrument on pandemic preparedness and response. And uh, this uh, INB started already their work, and they had so far more than six meetings. And the most important one was happened last July when they first agreed on the under which provision of the WHO constitution the uh, discussion and negotiation will start. And they agreed that the new instrument will be legally binding, and they agreed to negotiate under Article 19 of the constitution, which gives them broader scope, uh, but also they agreed not to close the door about using other article of uh, the constitution, namely uh, Article 21, 21 about regulations. And second issue in July meeting, they agreed on some element or some provision they may start to discuss and negotiate. And uh, in the discussion, they were very, very comprehensive. They agreed to discuss uh, several issues like one health, like equity, like uh, access to uh, pandemic control, uh, products. And in discussion on the access and equity, it was amazing uh, to see that member state doesn't want only access, but also they want timely access. They don't want to have access after one year, but they want to have access in the beginning and immediately after the, the the product or the, yeah. the 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 is available they also agreed to discuss issues like strengthening health system and uh, and and preparedness at the country level they agreed to discuss issues like collaboration uh, governance the whole of government approach of society approach research and development and those all these topics that were very important in the covid were not uh, are now uh, on the table of member state discussion. 194 countries coming together to discuss and agree about future collaboration 
under one international instrument. This is extremely important for uh, pandemic preparedness and response. The other work stream, which is equally important, is they decided to revise or to amend the International Health Regulation 2005 to make them fit more fit for purpose. Mm -hmm. And we're already having uh, more than 15 proposed amendments to this. And we, uh, the DG, the Director General, established an IHR review committee to bring all this amendment together and propose to the member state one consolidated text to, for their considering negotiation. This is, I think, two are a very important stream, and both of them, they will come to the assembly in May 24 for final approval. And of course, uh, these two work stream will need a lot of communication, collaboration to avoid duplication and to avoid also uh, some contradictory uh, provision in, in both of them. I think we are now, we started in the right start, and uh, I'm sure member states in their wisdom, they will come to something very strong that will prevent, uh, prepare, and respond to future pandemic. Thank, thanks, Gerard. Really amazing process you're coordinating on behalf of the organization. Um, colleagues, I'll, I'll challenge you to one minute to give me your one, one big idea for the future. It doesn't need to be fixed. Just tell us what you'd like to see. Um, it can be a moonshot idea. It can be a very practical um, uh, concept. But from your perspective and in the areas that you're working on, what do you want us to do moving forward? I'll start with you, Andrew. Well, simple, more inclusiveness, and not to expect that solutions uh, come, uh, you know, more inclusiveness, not to expect that solutions will come uh, top down. And this is, um, a process, uh, as Marion was saying, I am blessed to have veterinaries together with doctors in my DG. But you know, it's not an easy relationship. And, uh, and Minister Lautenbach has stressed the link with climate change. So these are not simple solutions. Hmm. We need the people who in a sense will also have to help us implement this to be included. So for me, it's not a big idea, is to have democracies be inclusive because it's democracies that have beaten the virus, Great. if I can say Perfect. so. Marion. Um, I was going to comment on vets in the room, but <laughs> I won't. Um, my uh, suggestion would be to develop uh, regional hubs to start experimenting how do we make this one health driver-based surveillance work there's there is some uh, examples but not a whole lot but we just need the room to experiment uh, i think that would be my wish taken forward we'll take that as a personal challenge in our hub as well <laughs> elsie Thank please you. yeah for me i think uh, we need to have collaboration very key integrated approach because most of the time we do things in silos we must be, have a, an integrated approach and proper coordination and that's my own take thank you thank you joad you lead our preparedness work in the organization i think the the most important lesson that we learned from the covid is that uh, country preparedness should be at the center of the global preparedness. There is no global preparedness without country preparedness. We are as strong as the weakest, our weakest. Second, can, existence of capacity are not enough. These capacities at the national level should be tested and sustained to be ready when we need them. Third, we need to have international solidarity to support countries who cannot uh, prepare themselves by themselves. And preparedness at the country level should be seen as investment, is not aid. When we support country A to be prepared, we are preparing the globe and, and protecting our country as well. And the last but not least, at the country level, all the part of the government should come together without forgetting, which we do very often, we forget and neglect consulting the communities and civil society. They should be involved. They cannot be only executing what what the Minister of Health said, but they should be prepared and they should contributing to any uh, preparedness plan. I think this is the lesson that we learned from the COVID. Thank you. So colleagues, please join me and thank the excellent panel. Thank you very much. Thank you. So thank you. 
thank you for your insights. Um, colleagues, sorry that we haven't had the opportunity to bring in questions uh, from the audience. To get the best out of this, we've uh, limited the opportunity to the stage and we'll have our two final panelists um, shortly. But you know, the thing about the World Health Summit is that you have access to all our speakers. So please do reach out to them in the breaks, coffee breaks, on the corridors and ask your questions. And each of them have promised to give as much time to you as possible uh, to discuss some of these issues. And you can see how complex they are from different perspectives, different levels across the various diseases, across event life cycles from beginning uh, to end and across geographies, you know, the challenges have been, are different. We had one colleague from one country speak, but I think uh, the, the national experiences will be completely different across many parts of the world, even though there's a lot that we have in common. So our next two speakers, uh, final colleagues for this session, uh, need very little introduction. So I'll ask uh, Jeremy and Joy to come to the stage as I introduce them. The Global Pandemic Monitoring Board is, is one of the unique um, structures that have been were created after the Ebola pandemic, uh, Ebola outbreak, it wasn't quite a pandemic, uh, to hold WHO and the rest of our community accountable for the work uh, that we are doing. Um, they will speak to this themselves. They're much better, they'll be much better at doing it than myself. But really, across all the ideas that have been shared in the previous panels, whether it's across the sectors, One Health, whether it's across countries, across organizations, promises to collaborate, these things often don't happen on their own. They require a little bit of uh, effort to ensure that it happens. So, Jeremy, I'll start with you, if you don't mind. The GPMB first published its first report in 2019, um, just before COVID uh, went into broader circulation. Can you tell us a little bit you know, about, firstly, a few words about the history of the board, um, it, what it has achieved, and, and really what we've learned from, from this period? Uh, thank, thanks very much, Chikwe. It's, it's great to be here at the World Health Summit again. I, I first came here in 2009. <laughs> the first um, one. The very first one um, on the invitation. I, I can't remember who, but I came from Vietnam. I, I remember that. Um, it's a good question. What's the GPMB uh, um, contributed to the world? Um, and I would pay tribute. I don't know if he's here, but I would pay tribute to our previous two chairs, co-chairs. Um, I, I don't know if he's in the room, but if he, he is. He was here yesterday, but he'll get the message. And Gro Brutland, um, who, who set this up under the auspices of the World Bank and the, and the WHO, and also paid tribute to to Tedros for then setting it up and the Secretariat is based at the World Health Organization, but there's never been a question, at least in my experience, of the GPMB retaining uh, its independence and being able to uh, challenge, criticize, hold to account, almost be the conscience of the world of what's actually happening. And I sort of see that as the role of, of, of GPMB. Has it been successful? No. <laughs> because if it had been successful, and I'll just make sure I get the words right, 2019, before the pandemic had started, before the word lockdowns and COVID were part of our daily lives, the GPMB published a report called The World at Risk. In 2020, it published a report, A World in Disorder, and in 21 published a report, A World Apart. That tells you something about the trajectory of the last three years. And I think if we are going to truly learn the lessons, not just of the last three years, but actually the last 20, it is that take warning seriously. This one's not over. This won't be the last. It's not the only one. And if we don't change what we're doing, not in warm words in lovely meetings like this with privilege, as Mike said earlier, but actually leave here and commit to doing something that would actually make things better. And I think ultimately that is about appreciating that it all starts and finishes with communities. And if we don't have strong health systems underpinning everything, we won't be able to deal with today's and tomorrow's challenges and we won't be prepared for the next issue. So that's at the heart of, I think, what GPMB is trying to do. Thank you. So no easy um, task, Joy. You've just agreed to 
co-chair this group into the future. And despite uh, Jeremy's tone, you know, preparedness is hard. Uh, and we'll have to keep pushing and seeing how we keep improving. So, but, but what is your perspective on this? And how do you think uh, the, the work you will now co-lead uh, with a, you know, a, a such an excellent set of colleagues, what are your expectations of the future and how you, you pull this all together? Considering the very hard tasks you have led on in the past and your incredible experience leading organizations and similar efforts. Well, th thank, thank you so much for the question. Very difficult. But as Jeremy has just said, um, we, 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 we seem to thrive on risk as a human family, which is probably not the best way for us to develop mm -hmm. and to evolve. Um, but we, we have lessons that we have learned. So what we would like to see happening is uh, as much as possible, holding ourselves as a global community accountable for implementing our commitments for dealing with the risks so that we can prevent pandemics, for preparing ourselves to be respond effectively, and for actually responding. Hmm. Now, how do we do this? The lessons have been learned. We, we heard President Selif talking about the work that uh, her independent panel has done. Jeremy has just told you about the work that the Global Preparedness Monitoring Group has done. We have had the Lancet publish uh, a, a, its commission's report the last few weeks. We, all of us, WHO, researchers, academia, we have all worked on this, including the private sector, civil society. We have all worked on this and we have all come up with solutions. So what is the best way of pulling together all these solutions that we have all come up with individually and collectively into one global framework? That is the big challenge that the, the current treaty that has been developed uh, through WHO is facing. Are you consulting everybody? Is civil society involved? Is the private sector involved? Is commu are communities involved? The women, the children, the young people who should actually drive the responses at, at country level, are they involved in pre preparing this treaty? How is the high level meeting going to be structured? What is going to inform that high level meeting? The financing mechanism that is currently uh, being set up under the auspices of the, of the World Bank. And you will know how is that being set up? Is it adequate? Now, we as the Global Preparators Monitoring Board are looking at all these structures all these recommendations, we are putting together what we would like to refer to as a manifesto, which is going to guide the way we are now going to monitor the situation. We will share this manifesto with you through consultations, doing a roadmap, working with all of you. As we work towards the, the, the treaty in May, as we work towards the high level meeting in September, but the key objective is for us all to appreciate what we need to prevent the next pandemic. That the global crisis that we are currently dealing with are not going to go away. None of them is going to go away. But we have to minimize the risks, whether the risks are the conflicts, whether it is the one health that is the, 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 the and whether it is the climate change, and the and epidemiological issues that are dealing with our failure to uh, reduce the depletion of our biodiversity, whatever it is, uh, whether it is nationalism, which is also driving uh, uh, the, the risks, whatever it is, or inequities, or exclusion, how we can make sure that all of these are incorporated into the global commitment that we are going to make. And then we would like 
to have a monitoring framework based on this that is going to hold each and every one of you accountable and ourselves as well and mutually accountable we want mutual accountability as well between countries and within countries and between sectors and within sectors this is our way forward but in order for it to work all of us as a global community need to work together Thanks, Joe. You've, you've really challenged us. Um, so I'll come back to you shortly. But Jeremy, you know, if we think about this, you know, you've called it severally, uh, you know, cycles of panic and neglect, and you know how um, I'm not even sure where in the cycle we are at the mo <laughs> at the moment because uh, there are so many things to panic about. But with all the other things happening in the world around the corner here all over the world the various events that suck the energy sometimes and resources out of this work but still we have to find a way of focusing on this how do you think we can find the balance between um the 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 health challenges the global context which we can't ignore and still a commitment to make progress incrementally every year yeah, I, you know, I think that is at the heart of the challenge we've got. Um, starting with the political, we, we started with um, Dr. Lutterbach earlier on, so we'll start with the political. It, it is extraordinarily difficult, I think, um, and I don't, I don't have that much sympathy, but it's very difficult for governments at the moment to deal with the challenges of today yeah. whilst also preparing for the challenges they know they're going to come tomorrow. I mean, uh, pandemics, climate change. You know, if you'd said five years ago we would have inflation running at the current level, we'd have an energy crisis, we'd have war in Europe and North, uh, Northeast Africa, um, we would still be in the midst of a pandemic which is not going away, and we'd have a geopolitical strife. You, if you'd asked, said that five or six years ago, you'd never have believed it. And yet that's the world we live in today. And as Carl said earlier, you can either spiral up or you can spiral no. down. Um, but you don't spiral up or down passively. I, I'm, I do not believe that history has just passively written. You, you take actions, people, governments, organizations, take actions which more encourage you to spiral up than spiral down. And that's the moment we're in at the moment. That's the moment you have to seize because if you wait, that window of opportunity to make a difference disappears. So if we don't do this now through the auspices of the WHO, through the auspices of GPMB, the fifth of the World Bank, if we don't do it now, we'll never do it. And I think the thing that I would plead with is that we bring together the sense of tomorrow and today. What I mean by that, and I come from a background in emerging infections, but let's put in the systems that are used and bringing value to communities on a Monday, on a Tuesday, when it's boring, not when it's exciting in a pandemic, but let's do it every day, as we heard from Elsie earlier. Because if you have that structure, people, surveillance systems that are helping you with dengue, TB, malaria, HIV, you will then make better use of them when a pandemic hits. So let's not separate today and tomorrow. And let's not just focus on what we might invest to prevent something that might be tomorrow or 20 years from now. But let's make the systems count today for the communities they work with. So there's trust, there's capacity, there's people, there's laboratories, as Elsie said, and they will provide utility every day and they'll be ready there for you when you need them. Thank you, Jeremy. Yeah. doing those boring things all of us do every day that never get attention but we know are necessary in order for us to prepare um Joy, maybe one last question for you re reflecting on the same circumstance H how do we keep this on the political agenda right the, the gpmb is important to all of us right but how do we make it important to the presidents the, that they recognize the value of the work that you're doing with us and uh, with the community but also recognize the value to them politically in their political future i i think as as uh, everyone has said today this is really about people and it is people that put the political leaders in power it is people that drive and feel the private sector 
whether they, they, they do so as uh, employees or whether they do it as, a, as a, the, the, the consumer. And it is people that are driving civil society and it is people that are the communities that we serve. So it is all about people. Let us give people the tools to, to, to help every single one of these structures to effect change. Normally, when we talk about that, people think of a revolution, they think of protests in the streets, they think of violence and conflict, but that's not what it is about. Giving people the tools, arming them with the capacity and the ability to effect change is what transforms any society. So let us make sure that in the manifestos of our politicians that we elect into power, into office, there is a commitment to preventing pandemics, to being prepared for the next pandemic, to responding effectively to pandemic, to equity, inclusivity, and collaboration and fairness. Let us make sure because we are the ones who give, put them into office. Once they are in there, let us constantly hold them accountable using the structures that, they, that exist, whether it is the parliament or whether it is the, the, um, the consultative mechanisms that they use. But I think information is power. So what we would like to do in the Global Preparedness Monitoring Board is give this information to all our stakeholders give make this information accessible to everybody make sure that the woman at community level knows what she is entitled to make sure that the board member at the world bank who is going to make a decision on an investment a hundred million us dollar investment in nigeria knows that the prevention interventions the preparedness interventions that are required, whether the investment is in industry, whether it is in education, whether it is in health, are actually built into that grant. We would like to see a situation where all of us as a human family appreciate that monitoring accountability for action belongs to all of us but we all need to know how to do it and that is what we'd like to be able to focus on so i couldn't have orchestrated a better way to end this session um, than than how you've ended it madame joy so thank you very much and really uh, thank you to all our panelists we started with the uh, minister and uh, the leader of the WHO's emergencies program. We had an excellent panel across national, global, regional, and we've ended it with two of our, um, our senior colleagues in the profession and have played an important role in a board that has been set up to hold us collectively accountable for the future. So I, I really hope that we can come back here in the next few years and reflect on where we are this year and where we've been and continue to push hard together uh, to hold ourselves, our colleagues and our leaders responsible for the future that we need to create together. So thank you very much, colleagues. Thank you for attending. Have a great rest of uh, World Health Summit 2020. <laughs>